Today, let's continue the conversation about what it could be like to live in the world post Roe. Welcome to Coffee with Kramer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Kramer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. I'll do my best not to rehash everything we talked about last time introducing the topic uh, on the reality of this leaked brief and what it means. Uh, I was simply making the point toward the end of that conversation uh, that being a realist about the culture, uh, I, I, I understand, I can see, and, you, and we all should be able to see clearly the systems that are in place which cause this debate, this culture war to continue persistently and to have become a part of the fabric of our culture over the last 50 years. And the idea that Roe would be overturned and therefore the culture war is over uh, would not be the case. That's just not how the society works on any level. And so for me, I was recommending at the end of the conversation last time that it's really important that we think beyond winning, having won a round of the culture wars or winning another round of the culture war because Roe didn't cause our culture to be interested in abortion. I uh, said last time it followed the nation's path. It didn't create the nation's path. And overthrowing Roe doesn't make abortion illegal. It reverts it to the states, as you're well aware by now. And the problem with that is that within those states and within our country overall, the divergent opinions about abortion will continue. And so it, it becomes really important for us to recognize that there is more shaping the mindset of people who favor abortion. I don't. I'm pro-life, and I want every, I want every restriction in place. I want us to defend life in the womb. But I, I can't look honestly at the people who are on the other side of that issue and simply relegate them to being people who love abortion, because that's not true. That's not what motivates this concern. And, you know, going back 150 years, I can see it in the trajectory of our culture, and we should be aware of where that came from. I've c covered that before in different episodes, so not, not, even, not even last week's episode, but before when we talked about abortion. The, and, and the pro-life issue overall. But for us, we have to recognize that there are other issues that lead women to think differently about pregnancy than somebody who's pro-life. There are other issues uh, that have to be addressed if we're actually going to bring the culture to a place where the sanctity of life can be preserved, can find uh, a more sustainable a place of shelter and safety. And so what, what I want to do to have that conversation, I want us to understand the values that people on the other side of this issue hold, because we don't. We caricature people on the other side of this issue. Uh, and I, I, I not entirely unfairly, but in some ways unfairly. And so I want to talk about that, but I can't until we first back up and recognize the values that underlie our own position on abortion. And obviously, I'm going to speak favorably about it because I'm pro-life and I want restrictions on abortion. So I'm going to take the three values that I think are most essential to what I view as a legitimate pro-life position. <laughs> obviously, by legitimate, I mean it aligns with my pro-life position. Uh, but I do mean beyond that. I mean, I, I have a background in this issue for decades. I taught bioethics in a public university for eight years. I care about the issue intellectually. I care about it philosophically. I care about it morally. I care about it religiously. So I'm, I'm ensconced in this issue, and I think these three values that I'm going to share with you 
are the right way for us to talk about being pro-life uh, without compromising our real commitment to that life and without creating a contradiction among ourselves, uh, making it sort of a paradoxical position to try to hold on to. There is a way to be consistent about this. And so the values are pretty simple. And, and, and then if we grasp our values, we can look at the values that people hold on the other side overtly, not trying to assign values to them that I want them to hold, but values they clearly embrace openly. And then we can recognize whether there's a connection or an overlap between the two. And that should make for a slightly better conversation than the empty-headed, red-faced debates we normally have where we're arguing for something that's not even connected to what the other side is arguing about. So our values are what have to come first. So we, so we start there, the values underlying the pro-life position. And they are these. Number one, first and foremost, simple. Basis, the, the basis of the traditional pro-life argument is that every human life is distinctly valuable. There are a bunch of different ways to understand that. There are different ways to express that. The word valuable is even contestable there because most people put on the concept of value a price, but this is not about price, as I'll mention again in a moment. It's about dignity. We'll come back to that word in a moment, a huge and important word that we've talked about before. But the basis of the pro-life position doesn't change. It is that every human life is distinctly valuable. I understand there are people who are pro-life who are also pro-animal life. So they're like uh, arguing for the protection, you know, to be vegan and not eat animals anymore and things like that. Fine, that's an argument that people can have and they can defend and that's a different position. But the pro-life position is not a pro-all-life position. It is a pro-human life position that we're talking about. And if you say, well, then you should call it pro-human life. Well, maybe, but historically people didn't. So I'm just going with the vocabulary that people have used. And this position is rooted in the idea that every human life is distinctly valuable. And as I said, there are a thousand details that intrude on that simple claim. I can say every life is distinctly valuable. And yet, I still recognize that there are a lot of complexities that come up, and I'm saying this as a strictly, purely pro-life person. There are still a bunch of complexities that come up about whether a treatment is required or permissible or omissible. And I'm talking about for an adult in a hospital. Uh, should we give this treatment or shouldn't we give it? Is it worth giving it to them or not giving it to them? And if you say, well, it's always worth giving it to them, even if it sustains miserable suffering for a person who's only going to live another hour or two anyway? Do you give them a certain treatment? Do you withhold the treatment or withdraw treatment, which are completely different questions, by the way? All of those issues intrude on, the, on, on this simple claim that every human life is distinctly valuable. It can still be distinctly valuable, and you recognize that it might not be appropriate to continue ventilation care for a patient after a certain amount of time and so on. Now, I'm, these are just basic bioethical concepts that are held by people who are pro-life and by people who are not pro-life. And, and not everybody looks at those things differently just because they have a different view on the distinct value of every human life. The point is that it's not an easy question to answer when a person is, for instance, at the end of their life. So as I mentioned, when you're trying to decide whether a treatment is required, it, you know, do you have a moral obligation to provide this you know, oxygen uh, for this patient who needs it at the end of their life? Or do you, is it permissible to provide this care for someone? Is it something that you could omit? And it's not necessary for them. We know that they're going to die soon anyway, for instance. So do you have to provide this care that's going to prolong their life another few minutes, as I mentioned a moment ago? Uh, and also, by the way, it's different when you ask the question of whether you should provide care for someone. So uh, should you, so you bring in a patient who's had a catastrophic injury and you are confident that they cannot survive the injury and you know that putting them on a certain machine or a certain kind of uh, care will extend their life for a little while, but it will also create a new set of obligations for you. Because once you start providing care for a patient in a certain way, it is a more significant question to withdraw that care 
than it was never to provide that care in the first place. And again, that's different depending on the care. I'm not even trying to resolve these issues. I'm just trying to make clear how how complicated it is for people to answer simple what you would think are simple questions about the value of human life when you're dealing with fine details. And you say, well, there are no fine details. You either save their life or you don't. Even people have uh, disagreements about what would amount to passive or active euthanasia. The idea of not providing care for someone at the end of their life or at a point when they would die without that care, they would find acceptable. And yet the idea of withdrawing that care and bringing about their death, they would find unacceptable, even so, it, even though it's exactly the same cause of death in that patient. And again, there, there's, a, there's a doctrine called the doctrine of the double effect. There are, there are questions about competence because we believe in informed consent, meaning that people have a right to say no to medical treatment, that, that a doctor can't force a person to, whether it's get a vaccination or to have a surgery because they want to treat cancer in a certain way, that you can't force a patient to do that. But if that patient is demonstrably incompetent, they're not able to comprehend or manipulate or demonstrate that they understand the purpose of their life. Uh, Manipulate information is what that means. If, If they don't pass this basic competency test, then they don't get to make the decision about refusing treatment because they're not thinking clearly in the moment. Uh, you know, a clear evidence of incompetence would be if a person's unconscious. You don't say, well, they can't sign the form, so I guess I can't uh, do this procedure on them to save their life. Obviously, you're going to look for someone else to make that decision. So we believe in informed consent, but then we also believe, in other words, a person could say no to treatment, but we also believe in requiring that person to demonstrate that they have some kind of competence to make a decision that would actually be in their own best interest so that they understand the decision that they're making, and so on. In the same light, we recognize among adults that there are some tragic circumstances in which the only way to save one life is to end another. That just happens. And you can say, well, no, there are no circumstances like that. But that's just not true. It is the case that sometimes you can only save one life, or you allow two people to die. And there are all kinds of examples where that's the case. There are all kinds of examples outside of of medical uh, care where that's the case. I mean, if you have one life preserver and two people about to go over the waterfall, you don't say, I can't save both, so I'm not going to save either. You do what you can to save one, and you look at the other one, and you don't say, tough luck, buddy. Uh, You apologize. You say, I'm so sorry, but I I only have one life preserver. I'm starting to save this other person. You get the idea. It, It becomes very complicated. And that's among people who value human life from the outset. It's already a complicated question. All of that said doesn't mean that I would say to you, we should compromise our standards on protecting life in the womb. It doesn't mean that at all. It does mean that the way we should express our care for life in the womb is not simply being anti-abortion. That's not what we are. What we are is pro-life. We recognize the value of that life. And I've said for over 20 years now, that the best expression of the pro-life movement's goal is that life in the womb be afforded the same respect and protection as all human life. It's that simple. I get that that's not how you write the law. I get that you don't write legislation that just says they get the same thing that, that an adult gets. I get that, that you have to write details into the law. But I'm advocating for legislators. I'm advocating for public policy. I'm advocating for the values of the culture to be based on the idea that life in the womb should be afforded the same respect and protection as all human life. That's, that's the position I've held for over 20 years, and I think that's the best way to express it. And then we advocate for law that protects that life, and it's written in all the detailed knowledge and language that a lawyer or a legislator needs to have to write up that law. And then we haggle over the details of what it means in case of an ectopic pregnancy or in the case of something else. We haggle over that in every discussion we have. But what, what isn't up for debate at that point is whether the life is valuable or not. That's what I think we should get on the table to begin with, that these little lives, these little prenatal lives should be afforded the same respect and protection 
as lives outside the womb. And what that does by, by stating it that way, I, I've always said it cuts the Gordian knot, you know, so it, instead of trying to untangle all these complicated ideas, uh, we just cut the knot, you know, take out the sword, cut the knot, and you're done with it. Just provide the same protection you'd give to life outside the womb. It also directly addresses the core of the problem that's been normalized in the culture for the last 50 years, that abortion is just one of the three options, you know? So you adopt or you raise the child or you get an abortion. Those are the, those are the options you have. And by saying, no, you know, life in the womb gets the same protection, gets the same respect as life outside of the womb, then we would be saying that this is not the same as the other two options. This is completely and radically different than the other two options we talk about when there's an unplanned, unexpected type uh, of pregnancy. And, but one of the most important things that it avoids is this. It avoids this, uh, and, 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 and this may be true or false, but this is the case. I mean, it may be true or false that this actually entangles us in this issue, but it is the case historically that the pro-life movement has been entangled with this movement promoting fertility. I'm not saying that's a bad movement. I lo- I think, pro- I, and we've talked about it. Uh, we've had an episode about the great gift that life is from God. So I love the idea of talking about fertility and all those positive things. But the promotion of fertility has also, rightly or wrongly, been entangled with the subjugation of women historically. And by looking at life in the womb and not saying oh, and it's so important for this woman to be pregnant. Oh, and it's so important to treat women like fetal containers. Instead of that, we're simply saying life that's prenatal should be afforded the same respect and protection as life outside the womb. Does that mean there'll never be a dilemma? No. Does that mean there'll never be a time when we have to have a longer discussion about what's going to happen with this particular pregnancy? No, it doesn't mean that. Just like you have long discussions sometimes in the hospital about whether a patient is going to receive a certain kind of care or not. I get that. I'm not saying it would never amount to that. But I am saying this, that unless we disentangle our value for prenatal life from this cause to promote fertility and therefore and again, rightly or wrongly, be associated with this movement that subjugates women, converting them into, and I'm, I'm saying this as offensively as the other side says, and I'm not saying it because I think it, but converts women into fetal containers unless we can disentangle that issue from the pro-life cause, we're never going to have a rational discussion with people who see this a different way. And it doesn't need to be seen that way. Because the thing we're actually trying to protect is the life in the womb. That's all we're asking. We're saying this baby exists. It's not just a piece of tissue. This is a baby. It's not fully formed yet, but this is a human life. And every human life deserves to be afforded the same protection and respect as every other human life. That's all we're advocating for. So that's why I think it's so important to learn to word it that way. This is just the first of the three core values that I'm talking about in the pro-life movement. The first one is just recognizing that every human life is distinctly valuable. And I, you know, as a religious person, a person committed to Christ, I believe in in this Judeo-Christian sort of model that every human being bears the image of God. No matter what their life has been like, no matter how steeply into the fall they are, Uh, We all bear the image of God. But whether you carry that communication or not, that they bear the image of God, it is still built into the idea that every human life has dignity. It is distinctly valuable. Distinctly valuable is different than saying it's worth a whole lot. You know, is it $100,000 or $200,000? Well, they're all valuable. No, distinctly valuable means there is no exchange that can be made. There is no, uh, I'll trade this baby for that baby and it'll all be good. We're all even. Uh, The idea of a mom going home from a hospital with the wrong baby isn't just, well, you know, it's a logistical mistake, but it's okay. I mean, you ended up with a baby. You ended up with a baby. Nobody's down one. Uh, We're all even. It's net zero. You know, it's all good. That's not okay because the life that we were given is the life that we want to raise or we want to be around because every human life is distinctly valuable. 
which means that you can't say, well, statistically, you know, we've got enough people. Yeah, we, we have enough. This baby is as important as every other human life has ever been. So it, you, we can't dismiss that value. So that, that's the number one value that we're talking about. Every human life distinctly valuable. Number two, and by the way, again, to, to repeat it, that goes with the word dignity. So when you hear the word dignity, this is an idea from philosophers way back. It's the idea that, that a thing either has dignity or price. Price means you can exchange it for something else and get something of equal or greater value. Dignity can't. It has a distinct value to it. So that's the idea. When we talk about human dignity, it's not just meaning, well, you can hold his head high. It's not that kind of dignity. It is the dignity that says this has a distinct value to it. There is no replacement for any of the lives that have been taken in the mass shootings lately, for instance. So the first episode that we recorded was before the Uvalde shooting. Uh, This one is after that shooting. And the idea that anybody would think to themselves, oh, well, we'll have more children. We can't. You realize in the wake of these shootings that happen all the time that uh, a human life is irreplaceable. No one can take the place. In that community, no one can take the place. In our state, no one can take the place of those children, those teachers, uh, the law enforcement, anybody who was affected by the shooting. And so every single life that's involved is of distinct value as dignity, and that's how we should regard it. Secondly, there is a second value that's associated with the pro-life movement, and it's, and, and, by, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not trying to latch these on to the pro-life movement. They are built into the pro-life movement. This second one is going to seem contestable at the beginning. It's, it's going to appear that way because of what happened in parts of the pro-life movement, and that means I have to clarify that I'm not talking about fringe elements here, and I'll clarify why in just a second. But this second uh, value, core value, that's associated with the pro-life movement is uh, the rule of law. There is an inherent value for the rule of law in the pro-life movement, Uh, and uh, now the reason you're hesitant when I say that, and especially if you're a person who's been pro-choice or who's sympathetic with the pro-choice side, is because you're thinking back to violations of the law that are a part of what, I, you know, I even worded it in, a, in an article I wrote about this. I said in the early pro-life movement, and it is in the early pro-life movement, but not as early as I wish uh, it was. It, you know, it, it endured way too long in the pro-life movement that there were uh, people who were in, and, and I'll express it this way because I believe it. Uh, so this is, I realize, an opinion statement, but, you know, the, the pro-life movement is scarred by the legacy of some people who were radicalized by the early rhetoric of the pro-life movement. And there's still some rhetoric in the pro-life movement that goes in this direction on the more radical side. And I'm talking about people who are bombing abortion clinics or who were assassinating physicians who provided abortions. You'll remember the names Barnett Slapian in 1998, who was, you know, shot from the woods outside of his house. Uh, some, there was a sniper who shot him. And then George Tiller, Uh, killed in 2009, who'd been running an abortion clinic for decades uh, when he was murdered. And, you know, those actions are so obviously contrary to the plea that the pro-life movements for respecting every human life that I've always known, and people who are in the core of the pro-life movement have always known that those elements were fringe. That is radical, outside the norm. That is not who we are. And, I, and, and if you say, well, I don't think there's a lot more of those than you think, I would say, man, I'm in the pro-life movement, and there are not. Uh, we view that as fringe and unacceptable. At the core of the pro-life movement, and, and I would say it in the article this way, the movement en masse uh, as a whole has been based on changing the law not on how are we all going to get guns and stop all the abortions from happening, but how do we elect the right legislators? How do we get the right judges appointed to the bench? How do we elect the right president, uh, executive officers? How do we, how do we by law bring an end to this practice of abortion? That means the pro-life movement has been built around the idea of the value of law. And and law has built into it this assumption 
that everybody has to be represented in that law, that the force of law is applied to everyone equitably. It's, you know, from the Magna Carta forward, that's the idea of the rule of law. And that's why we've spent 50 years trying to overturn Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is law. And and I don't mean by that Roe v. Wade makes it mandatory to have abortions, nor do I mean by that if Roe v. Wade's overturned, abortion becomes illegal. But abortion is ensconced in the law as a protected right based on privacy to begin with that changed in the in the Casey ruling but that it is a ruling in law that protects access to abortion so we spent decades trying to overcome a law or overturn a ruling that would then change the law of the land regarding the requirement for abortion to be legal so that we could then enact legislation that would make it illegal. That's the idea. That is a respect for the rule of law. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been acting in that way. It would have been revolutions and counter-revolutions, and it would have been, you know, civil wars going on right now. But that's not what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to change the law instead. For a long time, there was a movement, and it gained some traction. It never got far enough, obviously, uh, to pass a constitutional amendment. The idea of passing a constitutional amendment to recognize life in the womb in the same way that we recognized other lives that had been discounted in our society culture historically in the 14th Amendment and so on, the, the, the whole idea of this action was that we respected law, that if the Constitution declared that human life should be protected even in the womb, then we would have the rule of law on our side and we would be able to see the culture change in its trajectory. And by the way, all through those decades when we didn't have Roe overturn and when we couldn't get a constitutional amendment passed, we were working at the local level and working at the state level to get regulations tightened, restrictions tightened so that abortion would be less available. Or we were working within the bounds of the law to provide for some people, and there were not as many of these as I wish there were, but for some people just to provide ministries, services to people within the law so that they would have a reason not to have an abortion. And for a lot of people, that was the only way they could do that ministry. So they would have people come into their clinic who wanted to get an abortion, and they would say, well, we don't provide abortions, but we would love to talk to you about prenatal care or give you a free screening or provide a sonogram or give you these brochures and information. And, well, will you refer me to an abortion clinic? No, we we can't do that because we're pro-life. Whoa, what if I decide to get an abortion? Hands off, they would be. Uh, It's your choice, absolutely your choice. No one restrained them. No one said, no, we're going to tackle you. We're keeping you here. You walked in. You can't leave until you have a baby. Nobody was doing that because we respect the rule of law. That's the whole point. Underlying all of the pro-life movement en masse was a respect for the rule of law. And those rogues who went out of the way to do those insane things, and I I mean it, it it was inconsistent, incoherent in terms of the pro-life movement to, to go shooting an abortion doctor or to go bombing an abortion clinic or any of that. Uh, So, you know, that radical kind of action doesn't change the fact that we were pro-life partially because we respect the rule of law and we want law to protect those lives. We want the law to reflect that value for human life. Okay, so there are two of the core values. Number one, that every human life is distinctly valuable. Number two, that we value the rule of law, the rule of law itself third value, this idea, and this is extremely closely related to the second value that we were talking about, is equity, uh, justice, the idea of justice. Now, don't freak out on me here. We have, a, we have a weird culture right now, and people think if you bring up the word social justice that somehow or another you've gone off the deep end towards the liberal side of things. Every person who's advocating for the value of the sanctity of human life in the womb believes in providing justice for little children who are not receiving justice right now because abortion is so freely and readily available. Now, again, there's a whole debate to be had about whether you think that's unjust or not. That's fine. But from the pro-life side, that's not just protection. J-U-S-T meaning justice. That is not just protection. That is not equitable protection for the life that's in the womb. And so built into the pro-life movement was a desire to care for this vulnerable, 
population to seek justice for those from whom it has been excluded for the last 50 years. And I mean those little babies that are in the womb, those prenatal children. For for me, this was maybe the primary motivating factor that somebody has to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. So, But once you bring up this idea of justice, and all justice is social, you just add the word social to it, it doesn't add anything to it, except just to make clear that we are saying it should be a public form of justice. There should be a way that this is enforced socially, so social justice across the board, including for prenatal children. That advocacy isn't simply that only those who've been excluded from justice deserve justice, and this should help clarify some of the other issues for those of us who are pro-life, by the way. So we hear it as if we're only advocating for the vulnerable because that's who we're standing up for. So I'm, you know, if I'm standing outside an abortion clinic, my desire is for the baby to be protected because I don't think anybody else is representing the baby's interest there. So how do I represent the baby's interest? Well, I'm going to speak up for them, you know, care for this child, protect this child, respect this child, and so on. It's not that I don't think others deserve to be treated with respect. It's not that equity doesn't apply to everybody. The whole concept of equity, equality, the whole idea behind equity is that it belongs to everyone. So the issue is not that only the excluded are the ones who need equity. The issue behind the concept of equity or justice or fairness, and I know some people hate the word fairness for justice, but it's a really good expression of what justice is and of what equity is and of how the Scripture describes it. When you read it in Leviticus 19, it's pretty clear what he's talking about. From the old to the young, those who are impaired in some way, to those who are fully healthy, those who are poor, those who are wealthy, they all should be treated exactly the same way under the law. That's why I said this is inextricable from our respect for the rule of law as well. All three of these are actually intertwined with each other. You can't separate them from each other. But for the moment, just discussing the concepts, we can identify each one. So the value of each human life as distinct, uh, the rule of law, and then in this case, equity, justice, or fairness. And so the problem that comes up is people think you're only respecting the vulnerable in this situation, but that's not the point. The point here is that we need to care for the vulnerable. We need to seek justice for those who've been excluded because those who are powerful, those who are not excluded, they already have representation by their own means or they provide it for themselves or they can quickly find it because they have resources. This is what happens in a court of law. You know, when people say the wealthy are never prosecuted fairly or something like that, all they mean by that is the wealthy get access to the best representation because they have money to pay for it. That's one of the reasons they have their money, so that they can pay for representation whenever they're becoming, you know, exposed or vulnerable to some kind of risk in the society. And what we're saying is, well, we should provide that same kind of representation, that same kind of voice for everyone in the society. And since those who are powerful already have or quickly find that kind of representation, we want to speak on behalf of those who don't find that kind of representation. The weak or the vulnerable, in other words, need help. That's what it means for them to be weak or vulnerable. It's not, and and in this case, I would say this, it's not about tilting the field against the powerful. In this case, and that's how this feels, though. Even me saying this, if if you're listening and you have a pro-choice sympathy, you're listening to this and saying, but you're making it unfair for the women. You're fighting against the women, and I understand why it feels that way, as if we're we're tilting the field against the powerful in in this circumstance, the women in this circumstance. But it's not to tilt the field against women or against the powerful. It's to raise the level of the field for the vulnerable. And in this case, and and I'll say it this way, the pro-life movement has consistently done this. We have pleaded the case for what we believe are the most vulnerable among us. The children who don't, they haven't, not only have they not developed an ability to defend themselves, They can't even speak or cry out audibly on their own behalf. They can't raise an eye for sympathy that can be seen. And so because, you know, so as we see things and hear things, we recall them and we value them. Out of sight, out of mind. And this is how we've treated prenatal life. 
And so for those of us who are pro-life, we have said, don't, let's not be out of sight. That's why we provide sonograms for all these clinics. Let's bring them into the open and, and, and let these little children be seen so that they're protected. That idea in the movement is to give voice to the voiceless, is to advocate for the strength of the weak, to argue for the protection of the vulnerable. That's justice that we're advocating for. So you can see how these core values tie together. I mean, I, you know, the respect for every distinct human life, the rule of law, the idea of equity, they're inextricable from each other, from every one of those are tied together. It just in this idea, they tie together in the idea that all of them, all of those values emerge from the equality that's intrinsic to all human beings. And it can be expressed either as the attitude that we have about the dignity of human life or the uniformity with which we apply the enforcement of law or the equity that we use in the application of justice. But you can hear that, right? In all three of those things, the same idea is being communicated, that we can't value some lives differently than we value other lives, that we can't apply the law differently to one set of lives than we do to other sets of lives, that we can't treat some people as of more importance than we treat other people, that we apply equity in our way of practicing justice in the society. Those three are inherently tied together, and those are at the core of the pro-life movement. Those values, the respect for every human life as having dignity, the value that's given to the rule of law, the concern for justice to be applied, those are not unique to the pro-life movement. This part is not rocket science. Those are not unique to the pro-life movement. So what I should be doing is saying to myself, and this is what we'll take up the next time, what I should be saying to myself is, well, if, it, if it's the case that I have values that are given to me that go beyond the pro-life issue in terms of the sanctity of human life in the womb, if they apply to end-of-life care, if they apply to someone who's been in an accident, if they, if they apply to my neighbor, then people who are not part of the pro-life movement in terms of the sanctity of unborn life may actually share those values with me. I may have a point of connection or conversation with somebody that goes beyond simply saying, do you like abortion or don't you like abortion? And if I can do that, I might be able to create a dialogue, not only where I learn things, because I can learn some things from the other side, but where they might have reason to believe that they could learn something from me. If I can't learn from them, then it's hard for me to have a realistic expectation that they should learn from me. But if I can learn something from them, and if their values are somehow rooted in these same things that I care about, and maybe I can then learn something from them, then maybe, maybe they can learn something from me. And maybe there's hope for a better future than one where just every election we're trying to decide whether human life is going to be protected or respected. Maybe there is a long-term sustainable future for the value of human life in our culture. More about that next time. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Cream. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. <laughs> Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.